really, I wasn't expecting, we might take longer than two hours. <laughs> so uh, just put that in the back of your mind. You know, the truth is, it's actually really, really simple. It's one concept. And then we just build like ideas and theory onto that one concept. If you understand that one concept, you'll be good to go. The problem happens when people refuse. You this is every single time, every single time. People refuse to listen to what I'm saying and just jump ahead. They're saying, well, what if it was this and this and this? And that? Calm down. Let's just consider this for right now. Then we'll add on and we'll put all the stuff into it, okay? So if you don't understand something, wait until I like say the whole example because we're going to use one example. It's going to hold us for the rest of the, the lecture, okay? Or like we're going to use one example for literally maybe an hour just to explain this one concept. So if you don't understand something like immediately or you have a question, oh, what if it was like this or this or that? Just understand what we're, what we're doing right now and then start asking everything you want, okay? Uh, so... And remember, this is really important because people think if I don't ask now, he's going to move on. I am not going to move until we all understand this one concept. So with that said, uh, someone needs to meet his back. Is it Mariam? There, okay. And Dana, could you guys mute, mute your mic, please? Okay, so look. Um... We can do these questions, it's already linked, but these are all population parameters. So, uh, oh, right, I don't have to, wait, what? There's no, uh, this is so stupid. I can't pick a pen, why can't I pick a pen? There we go. No, no, yeah, I, I enabled, you were right. Thank you, okay. So these are all population parameters. That's why they're not a sample statistic. Uh, X uh, here, actually, I don't think it, I don't think, I think X is not even a population parameter. So don't even like uh, consider yourself, like don't even consider that as an option, you know? Mu is population mean, this is population uh, the standard deviation. Uh, how, could, how could a sampling distribution be produced? Uh, repeated sample uh, statistics from population. Remember we talked about it, how, you have a population, you take three people, and then you take their mean, then three people, you take their mean, three people take their mean, so a repeated sample, yada, yada, yada. What is the standard error of the mean? It's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. We talked about this, that's why you consider radical n. What, what does the null hypothesis specify? That there's no effect, and we'll talk about this in, the, in today's lecture. And uh, here he tells, he showed you a trial. He, this is how they usually report stuff. They give it to you as a table, and what you look for is the p-value. And here, the, the p-value is really less less than 0 0.05, so it's um, significant. And the you know difference between, for example, I don't know what the study was trying to prove, but the difference is there. There is a difference, and it's statistically significant. And whatever difference it was trying to prove, it's there. The difference is not uh, non-existent. So here we can reject the null hypothesis, which uh, which we'll, we'll get into. So what does what does null hypothesis and um, alternate hypothesis mean? This is mid stuff, right? Yeah, the questions are mid stuff, but like now we're entering, um, now we're entering a really difficult lecture. So I want you all with me. The null hypothesis means that whatever effect that you think is there is not, it's not there. It's, it's always the guy that's gonna be negative. It's gonna be, he's gonna be like, like my hypothesis is that the drug works. So the null hypothesis will say the drug doesn't work. Mm, the drug doesn't work. There's no difference between the two groups. There's nothing that differentiates this group from this group. Their means are equal. There's, no, there's nothing different from this group and this group. That's what null hypothesis says. Alternate hypothesis is the, is the exact opposite. Sometimes it's called the experimental hypothesis, but uh, you know I, I sometimes call it alternate hypothesis. And uh, just for, to make it easy, I, I, I usually say H0 and H1. So H0, when I say that, I mean null hypothesis. And H1, when I say that, I mean alternate hypothesis. Just this is nomenclature. So H1 means that, hey, the drug works, there is a difference, yada, 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 blah, 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 the drug works, there's, the means are different, blah, 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 right? So now, without using numbers, without using numbers, if you have 10 patients and you divide them five and five, and the five that got the drug and the five that got the placebo, if the placebo guys, none of them got better, but all five got better, without even calculating, you get the impression 
that what is it is it significant or is it not significant without calculating do you think do you guys think this will end up being significant or not significant yes so all of you say yes now why did you all say yes i uh, here, here i'm going to give you a question is there a chance that this drug right here it doesn't work but we just got lucky and they just managed to get better and these guys did, did not get better absolutely there's a chance but when they calculate that chance, that chance is very low. It's, it's going to be less than 5%, right? So what, so what does this 5, let's say we calculated the chance and it's going to be 2%. So let's say the p-value is 2%. What does this 2% mean? And when you understand that, what does that 2% mean? It really opens the, the, the ability to understand this, this entire lecture. So what does that 2% mean? It means there was a 2% chance that this drug, assuming it doesn't work, that these five get better and these five don't get better. It's only a 2% chance. So what do we say? Oh, you know, it's very lucky that we get this 2% chance and the drug doesn't work. So what's the alternative? What's the alternate thinking? Our drug works. That's the entire principle of, of uh, hypothesis testing. Why 2%? I just made it up. I just made it up. Okay. So, uh, let's say they calculate the p-value and it becomes 2%, right? So what does this 2% mean? What does this 2% mean? It means that if this drug, if we assume it doesn't work and these five got better and these five didn't get better, there was only a 2% chance of that happening. Only a 2% chance of that happening. Absolutely by luck. So what's the alternate, alternate idea? The drug works because there's only a 2% chance that the drug doesn't work and we get this, right? Do you, do you all understand this? I'm expecting a lot of no's and I, I, I hope I get a lot of no's. Yes, no, no, yeah, right, yes, no. So some of you understand, some of you don't. This is, this is typical. I, I always get this understanding. The probability that this is different by chance. Yeah, the probability that they are different by chance, by chance alone, assuming the drug. When I say assuming the drug doesn't work, what I'm basically saying is the, the chance that they're different by chance alone is 2%, right? It's 2%. So two things can happen or two, two thinking, two uh, ideas are acceptable. Either you really did get lucky and you got this 2% chance where the drug doesn't work and you happen to get this completely by luck or the second concept, which is that the drug actually works. Now, how do you make this decision? It depends on the chance. If it's less than 5%, you go with the alternate idea that the drug works. If it's more than 5%, if it's less than 5%, sorry. If it's more than 5%, you go with the percent. You say that, oh, for example, if it was a 10% chance, we so say 10% is very big. I can imagine that I did get lucky and I got this 10% chance. So it's probably not the drug that works. It's probably me that got the sample by luck, by chance alone. Sorry, could you please repeat? Yeah, don't worry. I'm going to repeat a lot of times this lecture. This lecture is difficult. I'm not going to lie. So let's, let's uh, forget this example. You know, let's, let's forget this entire lecture. <laughs> let's forget this entire lecture. Let's get rid of this. Because I really do not like his introduction to this. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so um, it is what it is. We are going to do what I think is the best course of action and end the meeting. I'm, I'm joking. We're going to do this here. So uh, you all can see a white screen. Why can't I get the chat up? It's always there we go. Okay. So, okay. Here is the example. Okay. This is the population of El Faisal students. And this is the average that they get for their biostats exams, right? Across all the years, okay? Their average, let's say is 80. All right? And let's say uh, the limits, the limits are 90 and I don't know, uh, what's the 70, right? And I got this through a SEM of whatever. Let's say uh, it, it has to be five year, right? Five. 
since this way two standard deviations will be 10, right? So this is our example, okay? I'm gonna do two different uh, studies, two different studies. The first study is I'm gonna take a sample of like 10 people, okay? We're not, we're not gonna concern ourselves with the calculations. So sometimes you might hear me make up numbers. Don't ask, how did he get this number? We're, we're not concerning ourselves in the slightest about calculation at this point. We are concerning ourselves with the concept and the idea. Okay, so I took a sample and this sample, let's say I said, uh, I'll, I'll take two samples, okay? Let's focus with the first one. Let's say I took uh, one sample and another. And this is the first experiment and there will be a second experiment down here. Let's say I gave one group water. Okay, so these guys take the water. And these guys don't take the water. So this is a sample of, of like 10 people. And this is a sample of 10 people. And these guys took water. And these guys took no water. Now here's my hypothesis. Taking water will make you get higher marks. So the null hypothesis, what is the null hypothesis? I want all of you to answer this. It won't do anything. Thank you, Iman. It will not do anything, zero difference. Now, my hypothesis is slightly uh, messed up. What I should have said was the water will either make you do well or will make you do worse. But for the time being, just for this example, just for this example, we will only consider if it makes you do well. So this entire area is 5%. I do not put 2.5% here, just for this example. Every other time is 2.5. Just for this example, I only care about 5% being here. I, I don't care about this side of the, of the tail. So my alternate hypothesis is going to be that the water makes you smart. If you take water, if you don't take any water, you will not be smart, okay? So now people who do not take water, they should, they should be the exact same as these people because let's assume these all, all people aren't gonna partake, partake in my example and are not gonna drink water, okay? Let's just assume like that, okay? I know everyone drinks water, but whatever. Let's just assume that this population of Al-Faisal students, we don't drink water, okay? So these are the same as them, they don't drink water. So their mean, let's say was 80, right? Their mean was 80. And then their limits was the same, 90 and whatever, and 70. Okay? Now, the guys who did take water, what do we expect? Now, will water really make you smart? No, right? So we, we expect that the mean here should be the same. It should be the 80 and everything, right? We all Are you all understanding with me? Whether you take water or don't take water, it's, like, it's not really good. Like, okay leave the crash course, go drink water and show me how you're gonna get an A in the, in the final exam. It doesn't make a difference, it doesn't make sense. So whether you take water or no water, you're not gonna really do well on the exam or not. So let's say we got the sample and it's 80. So now what we would say is we would take a p-value and let's say our p-value was like 35, or let's say, let's say this was like 81 or something, whatever. Let's say our p-value was like 80, uh, sorry, not 80. I wish that was real, same, Allah. Uh, so let's say the p-value was like 35%. So what does this 35% mean? It means that this sample that took the water, you know, when I compare it to this sample that didn't take the water or the population, I had a 35% chance of getting this mean, which makes sense because the water is not going to do anything. And it's like getting this a regular sample. I had a 35% chance of getting a sample that was going to get 81. How did I get this number? I calculated it, blah, 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 and I got 35%. So what, what does this 35% chance mean? It means that there was a 35% chance that, uh, you know, I got this mean purely by luck, which makes sense because the water is not going to do anything. So I, this sample mean was brought by luck, right? So, so the answer, the, the, the idea, the logic that you, you should follow through is that, hey, we got this mean by luck since it's more than 5% and uh, the water doesn't do anything. So you will conclude in the study, hey, water does not alone make you smart, okay? Now I'm gonna ask a question. So there's a 65%, no, 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 Faris, 
forget this thinking. Forget this thinking. You never flip it. You never, ever, ever flip it. Okay? You never flip it. This 35% chance, all it's saying, because look, you, you did a dangerous uh, thing. When I say 35% chance, I'm not saying this is the chance that the water does not help. I, I did not say that. I'm saying that assuming the water doesn't work, the chance to get this mean is, is 35%, right? You can't flip it and say, assuming the water works at 65%. Never flip it like that. It makes, it's zero, it's nonsensical. The only way, because p-value only has one definition and it's not allowed to be flipped. P-value only has one definition. It is the chance of getting a, a, a certain value or beyond that value or more extreme than that value, assuming the null hypothesis is true. So here our null hypothesis is that, is that the water doesn't work. So here our chance to get, for example, a mean with 81 was 35%. That's very high. So I mean, that's really, really high. So I probably did get it by luck. So then I would conclude that water, hey, water does not work. Water doesn't work. That's really sad, right? Uh, and then we would publish the study. They wouldn't even accept it. There was any, whatever. So you, you all understand this, right? Now, here comes the tricky part. Here comes the very tricky part. Is there a chance? I don't even want to continue the question. Just say yes. Just say yes. Is there a chance? Just say, just say yes. Fill the chat with yes. Okay. Is there a chance that even though the water doesn't work, we get a sample of 95 with a mean of 95? Of course, there is always a chance. And that chance is p-value. So now let's do it again. Let's say that, where's my, where the hell is my cursor? Okay, let's say that this mean was 80. This was the no water. And their limits are whatever, 1970. But then we, this, this group that was just taking water, let's say their mean was like 95, right? Their mean was 95. So, so on, on this distribution, the 95 would be here and the limits would be 90 and like 70, whatever. But this mean is here, 95. Is that significant? Yes, it is significant. Look, I, I saw a question of someone saying, you know, at 35, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, you, you were right. I saw it, you were right. But saying, focus with me on this one for now. So don't, don't ask, focus on this part. So look, we got 95%. Let, now let's find the p-value, blah, blah, blah. We looked at the z-table, we find the p-value of 1%. All right, so guess what? We had a 1% chance, assuming the water doesn't work, to get this by, by chance. You think, you think I'm gonna accept that 1% and I'm gonna say, oh, the water doesn't work? Hell no, I'm gonna say that the water does work and water does make you smart. You see, you see how, remember, this will happen 1% of the time, but sometimes you make a mistake. Now we can all agree, water doesn't work. I'm making this example so uh, exaggerated because I'm trying to prove a point that even though water doesn't work, sometimes it will look like it does work. The, there was only a 1% chance that you got this mean by luck. Only a 1% chance. So what do we say? You know, I mean, there's no way we got it by a chance. Like, come on, we're the lucky guys who got it by 1%. Ah, so screw that, we're publishing the study. Water makes you smart. It's gonna be on the top of PubMed and all medical students will thank us and yada, yada, yada. Until other people, how 1%, I'm lost, Shreya. Mm. All, right, all right, all right, relax, calm down, calm down. I just wanna take a quick survey. Did everyone understand this first experiment where we got a sample mean of like 81 and then the p-value was 35, so then we said the water doesn't work? Did everyone understand this? This one's simple, right? This one's simple, no. Okay, <laughs> okay. See, this is where it gets confusing. This is why I'm telling you, don't ask questions. Just focus on this premise, because if, if we understand this, we can understand all the later questions later. We're gonna do this again, okay? So this time it's a lot, I'm gonna go slower, slower. And if at any point you don't understand what's going on, stop me. We have a population of al Faisal students. Their mean is 80. Uh, 90, this is the first limit. This is the other limit, this is 70. Now, I'm not, I'm not gonna take two samples. Let's imagine that this population does not drink water, okay? I took a sample from them. And that sample, my mean was 85, okay? So if I plot 85 here, it'll be somewhere here. 
So just a quick question. Did, did our, was our sample significant? No, right? We, we gave these people water, thinking that water would make them great, amazing, but nothing happened, right? So our alternate hypothesis was that water works. Water is going to make you smart. Water is going to end up making, giving you a 95 on the exam, blah, 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 blah. It's going to be different from the, this population that was not drinking water, and water is going to make you amazing, and it's going to change you, and you're going to be significant, blah, 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 blah. The problem here is that when we did our, our sample, our you know, our mean was not significant, right? And if you find the p-value, if we calculate it, I'm just going to make up a number, it will be higher than 5%. So I'm just going to pick any number higher than 5%, let's say 30%. What does this 30% mean? It means that if we take this point exactly and everything after it, we had a 30% chance of landing here or anywhere here, right? So that's a very big chance. That's, you know, the chance that we got this sample purely by luck, the water doesn't work, purely by luck, the p-value is 30%. So we conclude, since it's more than 5%, we're going to, you know, say that the water doesn't work and it doesn't make you smart. Did, did this make everyone clear? Is everyone like clear on this idea? Yes. Yes. So far... You know, Im imagine this, so far I haven't said anything new. We understand all these principles. This is so far everything from, from confidence interval, okay? Now here is the confusing part. Same population, you know, 80 and 90, just the p-value again, please. Okay, the p-value again. This p-value, okay, just one, one second, one second. Just, I don't get how we can say that it works or not. I, I, I am, see, I am getting to that area. I just need to explain this and then we compare both this and this, but you're all not being patient. <laughs> just calm down, calm down. There are like five, there are like six, seven different questions in the chat. Relax, calm down, calm down. You guys need to first see experiment one, then experiment two, then it will make sense. La, you said the water doesn't work just now. Yeah, it doesn't because the p-value is more than 5%. Look, yeah, thirty percent example. If the look in in general, in general, remember confidence. The problem is we were just talking about this in confidence interval. If the p value is more than five percent, what do we say? Is it significant or not significant? Not significant. We all agree on this. When we say something is not significant, then immediately, immediately, the null hypothesis is true, right? If we say something is not significant, the water doesn't work. The jug doesn't work. This does not make you different from this. The water, blah blah blah. This should be, Annie, quick on your mind immediately, right? Uh, there's no way to explain this. You just have to quickly think of it. Because this is, Benny, I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, yeah, you, you get it. If I told you the p-value is 2%, is that significant or not significant? Yes, it is significant. So then when it's significant, we always say the alternate hypothesis is true. We say that the drug does work. We say the water does work, yada, yada, yada. Did this make sense? It's, it's literally the percent that, that dictates whether, whether the water works or doesn't work. If it's less than 5%, the drug works, the water works, blah, 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 the, the groups are different, blah, blah, blah. If the percent is greater than 5%, we say the water doesn't work, the drug doesn't work, blah, 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 nothing works. It's the, literally the percent that makes the difference. So it's 30%, which is not significant. So our null hypothesis is the water doesn't work. Is this correct? Yeah, so the null hypothesis is true. In our, our null hypothesis, which says that the water doesn't work, is true, okay? Because remember, we have two hypotheses. We have the null hypothesis, which says that the water does not work, and we have the alternate hypothesis, which says that it does work. One of them has to be true. How do we pick which one? It depends on the p-value. If it's more than 5%, then we say the null hypothesis is true. If it's less than 5%, we go with the, with the alternate hypothesis. Yeah, so the null hypothesis is either, how do we pick? If it's more than 30%, if it's not significant, then we go towards the null hypothesis. If it's less than 5%, we go towards the alternate hypothesis. Okay? This is just a rule. But I don't want you memorizing the rules. I want you understanding the rules. You guys, okay, you guys get it? Now, we're going to erase all of this, and we're going to do the example. But you need to pay attention with me as we're, as we're doing this. So this is the population, blah, 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 80 
and then blah, blah, blah. Limits are 90 and 70. I'm not going to write them. This is the sample we took. Again, everyone in the population, let's say they're not taking water. Now, ideally, you should take a sample and then make them not take water, and then you compare the two samples, whatever. We're just going to do it quicker. So no water, population taking no water. My hypothesis, the alternate hypothesis, H1, I'm going to say that the water makes you smarter, the water will get you grades, water, blah, 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 blah. The null hypothesis, I have it right there next to me. It says the water does not work. The water will not make you smart. The water will blah, 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 blah. There will be no difference. Let's say in my sample, I got 85. So then I would write this mean. I would represent this mean onto this you know, distribution. So it would be somewhere around here. When we calculate the p-value, it's going to equal maybe something like 30%. Now, we don't care if it's 30 or 31 or 32. We just care. Is it more than 5%? So is it significant or not significant? Not significant, okay. All of you are saying not significant. So now, which one do we go to? Do we go to the null hypothesis or the alternate hypothesis? Null hypothesis, okay. Now, I'm happy with all of what you're saying. You all understand that we go to the null hypothesis, right? Now, let's do the second experiment. Let's say I did the study again. Same exact study. Again, I'm going to give them again water. And let's see what, what the sample I got. Whoops. What's the sample that I got? Let's say I got 95. Let's say I got 95. I plot this here. It's 95. I get a p-value. I check the p-value and it's 1%. Now, before I say, I say significant or not significant, just relax. Is it possible for me to get this mean even if the water doesn't work? It's possible. So what is the chance? What, what's the chance? It's right there in front of you. What's the chance? It's 1%. It's 1%. It's, it's, look, it's, it's less than 5% if I don't give you the p-value. But here, I literally gave you the percentage. The p-value is 1%. So the answer is 1%. Now, there's something that you mentioned above the um, Iman. So the alternate hypothesis is that our hypothesis is basically right. Wait, don't say right. You should say that our hypothesis simply states, like, look, look, I need to really make one thing clear. When we say our hypothesis and null hypothesis, it's not a competition. It's not like we have to beat the null hypothesis. It's just to set up this sort of, it's, it's just to set up two statements and find out which one is true. One statement says that it does work. One statement says it doesn't work. Our job as the biostatisticians is to find out which statement is true. We do that by p-value. Now, in this case, the p-value was 1%. Well, what does this 1% mean? It means that if we, for some reason, assume that the water doesn't work, if we assume that these guys did not take water, now they did, they did, but if we assume they did not take water or that the water doesn't work, yada, yada, yada. In other words, if we assume if they are just like this population and we calculate the p-value for this point, which is 95, it would be 1%. And it makes sense. Look, look at how, like it's not even on the distribution. <laughs> But like, it's so, it's so rare to get this point. And you want to tell me that we got this point and water doesn't work? It's, it's nonsensical. So since there was only a 1% chance that we got this, this mean, which is right here, which is on the edge of the distribution, only a 1% chance of getting that, assuming the water doesn't work? Well, hell no, I'm going to assume it works. So the p-value is 1%, and I'm going to say that it does work. And I'm going to say that h1 here is true, but h0 here was true. So we accept the alternate hypothesis. I'm, say, I'm seeing people that don't get the 1% part. Look, wait, wait, wait. Like, what don't, it's the, the problem is that it's the same as the 30%. It's just the only difference is that here the p-value is greater than five and here the p-value is less than five. Like, forget that it's 1%. I'm just pointing out that it's, it's less than 5%. Did you get it? Yeah, so here, here, uh, I sound really frustrated. I'm not frustrated. I'm just like, <laughs> I will mention this. I'll just take a small little detour. It sometimes irks me that, like, let's say I tell you, in one lecture, that two plus two is four. And then in the next lecture, I tell you, so what's three plus three? And then everyone gets confused. Everyone says, well, no, what, what do you mean three plus three? You only told us two plus two. No, it's, it's the same concept. Yeah, it's the same concept. I'm just changing the principle. So, so here, 
remember all of you in the previous lecture, when I tell you, is this significant or not significant, all of you could answer it. But now there are some you know, confusing principles that for some reason I can't, I don't know why, but it's the same exact idea. Here in, in, the, in the first experiment, our p-value was very high, higher than 5%. For that reason, we say that the null hypothesis was true. You know, we, we, the chance that we got this by luck was 30%. Well, 30% is so high, it's higher than 5%. For that reason, I say that, hey, I probably, you know, got this 30% and my, my, uh, the water that I gave probably doesn't make a difference, right? Since the p-value is 30%. But here in the bottom example, look, and, and this is really important. This is uh, adding a, an extra, what does the p-value rep represent though? So, <laughs> Allah Osama, <laughs> I will, uh, honestly, I, I feel like killing someone right now <laughs> because p-value is something we talked about in our midterm. And I'll, I'll quickly, quickly take a detour explaining it. This is our sample, Hun this is our population, 100, right? A terrible drawing, but we're going to roll with it. Now, 110. Osama, you, you will answer me. You will answer. Because I'll show you that you know the answer. What's the chance that we got 110 or more than that? Did you guys, like, forget this, all, all of this? Like, I don't get it. <laughs> okay, so let's say the sigma was, like, 5. So what's the chance of getting this? this? So what do you, what do? You do? Like forget numbers. No, I want Osama. I want you. I want you to tell me what do we do from here. What's our formula? <laughs> oh, everyone's gone. Like no one. Sheesh. Yes. No. I, I will tell you why. Sheesh. Because because this is something. If you don't understand it now, you're not gonna understand any of the stuff that I'm talking about here and here. So what's what's our formula? I'll help, it's Z equals, come on. I right, was gonna assume you don't remember, it's fine. X bar minus mu, yes, divided by S E M. All right, in this case, just because I gave you the standard deviation, let's just you know remove this and put standard deviation, okay? So then let's say we, fi we finished our calculations, it's Z equals uh, 10, uh, 10 divided by 5, which is 2. 5, which is basically 2. So our z equals, our z equals 2, right? So that means that when you go to the p, p table, the, the, the z uh, table, you'll find a p-value of 5%. So what does that 5% mean? That 5% means that you had a 5% chance of getting a value at this point or beyond that point, right? You had a 5% chance of doing it. Now, the same thing here, what does, what does a p-value of 1% mean? It's the exact same thing. You had a 1% chance of getting the mean here or beyond it, assuming it comes from this population. Now, why do I say assuming it comes from this population? We're gonna forget I asked that question because it's gonna come up in like five more minutes. But do you understand? Yeah, that's it, basically. The p-value here was 1%. What does that 1% mean? It means that there was a 1% chance of getting this mean or beyond that mean, assuming it comes from this population. But why do I say, why do I keep saying that? Just five minutes, just wait five minutes. It's coming up. Yes, you got it, okay? So that's what the, now the p-value here, 30%, what does that mean? It means there was a 30% chance of getting this mean at 85, this is 85, or beyond it, assuming it comes from this population, okay? Now, why do I keep saying that? I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to it. Hold your horses, I'm gonna come to it. But the basic idea, now we took one sample and we said that the null hypothesis is true. And we took another, another sample and we said that the alternate hypothesis is true. Even though they're both, yeah, I mean, they both are the same, right? Essentially, they're the same. Both had water, both are from middle facial students. Now, obviously, in real life, only one can be true. Can you all agree with me on that? Where is my mouse? In real life, in real life, only one can be true. Now listen very carefully. Sometimes, whether the null hypothesis or the alternate hypothesis is true, most of the time, it coincides with reality. Sometimes there are mistakes, sometimes. Now in this case, I'm gonna give you the reality. The reality is this, water doesn't do anything. And if you don't believe me, 
leave the crash course, only go drink water for the next two weeks and then do your exam. And you'll see that the reality is that. So the reality here is that the water doesn't work. However, you, you can clearly see sometimes, sometimes this will happen where we eventually lead to saying that the null hypothesis is true, but sometimes this will happen and you'll get this p-value and you'll say it does work. This is called an alpha error. Now, I just want everyone to appreciate that for a second. Don't ask what's alpha, what is this? This is something completely new. Okay, that's called an alpha error, all right? Now, what is alpha? It is when, in reality, the drug, the water, whatever, doesn't work, but we think it works. Now, there is always, with any study, any study, a 5% chance of getting an alpha error. Remember when I was talking to you about the confidence intervals and how this like sort of tree and this slide that talks about how one missed the true population mean? This is the exact same concept, but it's, it's using you know, samples and hypotheses. Sometimes it is possible to think that the water works and to accept your alternate hypothesis, even if the reality is the opposite. The tricky part is that, you know, in real life, we don't know what the reality is. Now here it's obvious because water is not gonna make you smart. But what if in the future, like 10 years down the road, they find out a very dangerous side effect of a, vac of a vaccine? How can you be sure that that's not an alpha error? Right? Sometimes you don't know the reality. How do you know if the vaccine has a side effect? It doesn't have a side effect. So there's always this chance, this small, small chance that you make a mistake, right? Do you all understand this? It is, is, it, is it always when we accept the alternate hypothesis, the p-value is significant? Yes, always when the p-value is significant, you accept the alternate hypothesis. But remember, like this is the entire idea. If your p-value was 1%, yes, so that, the 1% is the mistake. And how, how often will you make that mistake? 5% of the time. 5% of the time you'll make that mistake, right? If you keep repeating the study, 5% of the time you'll have a mistake. And he has a beautiful like meme, you know, memes back from his day, uh, of this, of this um, idea that the, the more you keep repeating studies, you, like let's say you repeat here, I want all of you to answer this and you all understand it now. Let's say the reality is that the drug does not work. The drug does not work. Okay, it doesn't. I'm giving you the reality. You don't know, but I'm, I'm telling it to you and let's just assume that's the reality. Okay, so drug doesn't work. If you make the study 20 times, how many times will you accept the null hypothesis and how many times will you accept the alternate hypothesis? That's the question. And I gave you the reality. The drug doesn't work, but you're testing. You don't know, you're testing. So how many times? Yeah. One time for alternate hypothesis. 20, or sorry, 19 times you will accept the null hypothesis. So again, what's the idea here? If I, if I tell you that the drug doesn't work, it doesn't work, but you want to test if it works. Well, 95% of the time, it's not going to work. You're going to find, you're going to have this whole scenario happening, right? Where you finally end up accepting the null hypothesis. 5% of the time, you'll, you'll have something like this happen. Right, so in this sample, you know what went wrong? Maybe I, my sample, somehow I got all the Dean's List students and you know, I, I, they all got the 95, right? So maybe my sample was stupid, but it's not because I made the sample stupid. I didn't go hand, hand pick all of those students. Randomly, it can happen. Is it possible to randomly pick 10 Dean's List students for your sample? Yes or no? Is it possible to randomly pick 10 Dean's List students for your, for your sample? Of course, it's possible, just by chance alone. Just by chance alone. Now, is it likely? No, it's not that likely, but it could happen. And when it does happen, you're gonna get an alpha error. You're gonna end up having a scenario like this bottom one where you'll think the drug works, you'll think the water works, you'll think something works, but it doesn't, right? So do you all understand this? Because we said the 5% is significant. Yeah, I, I said 5%, yeah. So, you know, if you take 20, if you take 20 and you find 5% of 20, then one is the study, right? So one study will be wrong, 19 studies will be correct. 
If you do a hundred studies, I'll make it simple. If you do a hundred studies, how many will, will accept the null hypothesis? How many will accept the alternate hypothesis? Assuming that the reality is that the null hypothesis is true. Five alternate 95 null. No. I saw, I saw Anani, I saw your comment on repeating this. I'll repeat this a lot of times. No worries. Okay. Is this like giving the benefit of the doubt? <laughs> I mean, like, mm. yeah, thank you. I, I'm really happy you said never mind because I didn't want to get into that. All right. So, how do you tie alpha error into it? Yeah. So, basically, um, if the reality, if in real life the water doesn't work, you still have a choice to pick. Either the null hypothesis is true, which goes with reality, that would be the correct choice, or you end up getting lucky and you accept the alternate hypothesis because you got so lucky with your sample, you got your dean's list students or whatever, and then they gave you a, a p-value 1%, you think, oh, the water worked, the water made them smart. No, you just got lucky, you got the dean's list students that helped you. It's not the water that made them smart, it's just, you know, whatever. And okay, hold up, I know this is a terrible example. Just because your dean's list doesn't mean you're smart. That's a really important thing. Okay, I, let's say you pick people that their GPA is whatever, whatever. You guys get the example. Don't I? I, don't, I didn't want to mention this. It's kind of stupid to, to mention that. So why will why will five percent be the null hypothesis? So yeah, because we made okay. Why do you want us to repeat T lady? Remember T lady? Our cutoff is five percent. Our cutoff is five percent. Why did we pick five percent? Because tea lady came over in a tea party and for some reason they have nothing other to do and to talk about how tea lady can make, can make a difference between sugar and milk, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, so I hope you got that, okay. That's why they picked 5%. So we're gonna do this one more time. What is alpha error? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll do this. My brain isn't processing this alpha error part. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. It's fine, it's fine. So uh, yeah, yeah, well, relax, relax. We're gonna do this again. And with a different example this time. So. Let's say I have uh, a group of people. So this is, this is the population, right? And then their uh, systolic blood pressure. Oh, you know what? I have a, oh no, no, but I want to use this example for the next one. Okay, okay. so I, I have this example. Uh, let's say this is people's uh, satisfaction levels, okay? Or no, actually no. Uh, I want something that really sounds like it's not gonna do anything. So. Let's, okay, let, let's use a similar example. So the average in face, so let's say it's 70. Okay, next year it dropped for some reason. <laughs> okay, and then the cutoffs are, for example, uh, 85 and uh, 60, or sorry, 55. Okay, 55, right? 55. So now, um, my sample, my, uh, I'm going to take a sample and I'm going to tell them, hey, I'm going to give you KitKat. And if KitKat, uh, I'm going to check if KitKat. Make, gives you a higher mark, right? So I took this sample and then your, your sample, it got an 80, okay? So then you go back to here, you go back to the top part and you say, okay, so they got like maybe here, 80. So what's the chance of getting 80 or beyond 80? What's the p-value for that? So then you find the p-value, it's gonna be something like maybe let's say uh, 25%. So p-value is 25%. So you gave these people KitKat, the population does not have KitKat, and your alternate hypothesis is that KitKat makes you smart, gives you better grades, but then your sample got an 18. So does this go more with the null hypothesis or the alternate hypothesis? I want Anani to answer. What do you, okay, all of you are saying no. <laughs> Anani, specifically, do you understand? Yeah, you, okay. So you understand why it goes more with the null hypothesis. You, you, your sample got an 80 and it doesn't cross the limits of the confidence interval. Does, yeah, it's just, there's nothing special about this. You had a 25% chance of getting this by luck, which is a lot, it's more than 5%. So you instantly assume that the null hypothesis is true. And in reality, I'm telling you this, sometimes you don't know what reality represents, but I'm telling you this, the KitKat's not gonna do anything, right? So it's not significant, not significant. Null hypothesis is true. And this would happen 95% of the time, assuming the reality is that KitKat does not do anything, but I already told you KitKat does not do anything. 5% of the time, 5% of the time, you will cross this limit. You will get a mean here. 
because it's 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 by chance. You you'll get it. It's by chance. It's gonna happen sometime. If you repeat the study a million times, you're gonna it's gonna happen. You know. So let's say you picked a sample and you happen to pick a sample of all the students that got really good at the at the, at the test just by just by luck, right? It, it can happen. So maybe they will get like a ninety. Their their mean is a ninety. So then you go back here, ninety. Now just by looking at it, is it significant? Here are the limits. This is the limits. Is it significant? Yes, so p-value would be something like, someone said no, Shahad, why do you think it's no? If these are the limits, the confidence interval limits, and this is the 90, do you think that this would be significant or not significant? Yeah, it's significant, I, I agree with you, it's significant, right? So this should be significant, and your p-value would be maybe something, I'm just gonna make this number up, it's gonna be like 2.5 something, okay? 2.5, okay, yeah, I don't know, I'm just made a number up. So now, what's the interpretation of 2.5? You had a 2.5% chance to get this 90 or beyond this 90. Only a 2.5% chance. And this is assuming the KitKat does nothing. So what's the, what's the better thinking? Oh, I, it's the 2.5% chance to get this sample? No, the, the, the sample, uh, I got it because KitKat made me get it. KitKat pushed this, this mean all the way up here. It wasn't because of luck. It was because the KitKat pushed it there. So then you say that H1 is true. Now, is this in reality true? No, I told you reality, KitKat does nothing. But just by luck alone, this can happen. Does this make sense? Yes. I just want to see one person say no, and then I'll repeat it. So alternate, alternate hypothesis. Yeah, H1 is true. Yes, OK. All right. Now, please never forget this. I had a problem happen when I, I forgot which batch it was, but we explained everything. And when I asked them questions, they couldn't answer anything. So, okay. Remember this. Breathe it in, understand it, like it, love it, do everything you want to it, whatever you want to it. Most importantly, understand it, commit it to memory. Whatever you want to do, just don't forget it. <laughs> Please, for the love of God, don't forget it. Okay, now what's the time? All right. So if this lucky percentage happened, then, uh, yeah, then, then it would be considered an alpha. We call it an alpha error. Now let's let's. Let, I'm, I'm going to confuse a lot of people here, okay? And this is fine because the first time I learned this, it, it's it's a confusing concept. What if KitKat really does work? Okay, so what if KitKat really does work? Now that is the problem. So I'm not going to use KitKat because KitKat doesn't really make that much sense. So I'm going to use something that does make sense. Okay, so let's do. Now, uh, now everything is going to flip and all of you are going to hate me for it, but I am going to love this so much, okay? And we're going to keep repeating this, okay? This is the population. Here is Al Faisal's biostat average. It was like 70, okay? Okay, and this was across all the batches, all the batches, okay? And the limits are 80 and uh, 70. So I'm just going to put the limits here. It's like 80, okay? QV sauce music, yes. This really needs to be sauce music. Um, okay, so let's use a sample. You guys are my sample, all of you. I gave you a crash course. Would the crash course be significant? That is my, that's my alternate hypothesis. Now, now, just because I'm a fan of the crash course and I think the crash course would help, I'm gonna make it seem, the, the reality, I'm telling you the reality, the crash course does help. And you know, whether you think of it or not, the crash course does help, okay? so. So uh, I took this sample of all of you guys. You guys are like 42 people or something in, well, in, in the Zoom call. So you're, you're all, you, after your final, I came and asked you all your marks confidentially, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. And all of you, I, I, I got the mean, and the mean was like 85. Recall that the mean was like 70. So the mean was 85. So now I would go back to here. Now, wait, I need to really, because here's where I'm going to blow all of your minds. Let me erase, erase this. Okay. Now, we don't know the reality, right? So we do the same exact thing. Remember when I was saying, I'm going to finally say it, I'm going to say that, uh, why do we say assuming that they come from that population? Here's why. If we continue this X value, here is 85. It will correspond to a value that is maybe around here, okay? So now if I want to calculate P value, I have to assume that you guys here 
that all of you came from here. I have to assume that you can, I have to assume that you're not taking a crash course in order to find out whether the crash course helps. This is confusing. I know, I know it's confusing. I know you didn't even get it the first time, but look, remember, remember when I was going back here and I was saying, oh, hey, look, this is the value. So what's the P value? Oh, it's here or beyond that, right? Well, the only way we can actually find out the P value is by using this distribution, not this distribution. So I have to assume that you didn't take a crash course in order to find out the P value. Now, even though you took a crash course, I'm gonna assume you didn't because I need to, I need to find out the P value here in this distribution, the people who didn't take a crash course, not in this distribution. It doesn't make sense to find the P value in this distribution down here. So the normal population, no, the normal population did not, everyone in Al-Faisal, so let's assume only you guys took the crash course. Everyone in Al-Faisal did not take the crash course, right? This is across all the batches, uh, batch 10, nine, blah, 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 blah. You guys took the crash course, so you, you're my special sample. But even after I gave you the crash course and you took the final and I collected your mean, which was like 85, when it comes time to calculations, I have to assume you did not take the crash course. I have to assume you come from here. So here's, here, here's the p-value. The p-value for you guys is the chance that you got 85, assuming you, got, you came from this population, assuming using this distribution. So what's, what's, the, what's the chance? It's obviously gonna be less than 5%, right? Because it's beyond this limit, right? So do you all agree with me that 85 should be significant? Do you all understand why I keep saying, assuming you come from that population? No, okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll explain it to you. Let's not, let's not say you come from that population. Let's say, what's, what's your p-value using this distribution? Your p-value will be 50% because all of this is 50%. It doesn't make sense to use this distribution down here. It doesn't make sense to find the p-value within this distribution. You assume that this 85, came from here. So what's the chance of getting 85 coming from here? You'll calculate it, it'll be like 2%. This 2% makes more sense to use than this 50% because we need to assume that the null hypothesis is true. Remember, what, what, what did we always say about this, about this p-value? It's the possibility of getting this value by chance by chance, not by a crash course, not by Kit Kat, not by water. It's the possibility of getting this value by chance. So we have to assume that there's no crash course, that there's no water, that there's no uh, Kit Kat. We have to assume you come from here in order to find the p-value. Now, in this case, it was two. In this case, so the population is everyone and the crash course are the sample. But when we calculate the p-value, we assume they came from the population and they're not taking the crash course because that's the only way you'll find out by chance how much it is. Does this make sense to all of you? That's why. No? Okay. So I'll, I'll repeat it one more time, but, but just to make it complete, that's why the definition, the most important part of the definition, is the, the chance of getting a certain value or beyond that value, either to the right or to the left, depending on where you are on the curve, assuming the null hypothesis is true. If you go back to our midterm lectures, you would see that, you would see that sentence. And I, and I remember I told you that I'm not gonna cover it now because this is for your final lecture. And here, right now we're talking about, it, okay? So why does it say that? Why does it say assuming the null hypothesis is true? Because if we find the p-value of this here, I'll, I'll show you, what's the p-value of this 85? And this is the curve. Okay, what's the chance? Wait, the curve represents what? Okay, this curve is of you guys who took the crash course, the sample that I took to find out whether the crash course is good or not, okay? This is the population of all facial, all facial batches. And let's assume they didn't take the, the crash course, okay? Now let's find the p-value of this one, okay? What is the null here? The null hypothesis is that the crash course does nothing. The crash course does not help you. The crash course does nothing. The alternate hypothesis is that the crash course does help you. The crash course gets you better marks, okay? I, I, I look, 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 Liam, your question, you need to delete what you wrote because <laughs> it, it, it's, you just forget, forget what you wrote, forget what you wrote because it's what you wrote is nonsensical. I'm really sorry. It doesn't make sense. 
what we are just forget, forget your questions, forget your questions. Just listen to what I'm saying instead of just trying to ask and delve deep within this concept and everything. Again, this, this everything that I'm talking about now, I'm just explaining to you why back in the midterm lectures, and you need to know this for this lecture, this lecture why are we saying the p-value is the chance of getting a value or beyond that value? Assuming the null hypothesis is true. Why do we say that? Because recall when we were talking in the previous example about water, I kept saying, uh, this is the chance this is the probability of getting this by chance, by chance, by chance, by chance, by chance. When we say by chance, we don't mean by Kit Kat or by crash course or by water or by this or by that. We mean purely by chance. The only way I can do that is by assuming that you guys did not have a crash course, even if you did, because I want to make my calculations on this distribution not this distribution. Because if I make my calculations on this distribution, assuming you did take the crash course, it will always be 50%, always. You don't believe me? Here, let's make the calculation right now. Z, right, equal, and Z will be zero. You will, you will see. So 85, so 85 minus, what's the chance of getting 85 uh, in this population, in this, in this sample, which has a mean of 85. It'll be 85 minus 85 over zero, and the sigma is like six. Okay, zero over six is zero. Zero, go into the Z table, it'll be 50% which makes sense, 50%, the entire half of the curve. Does this make sense? No, because we want to know the chance of it happening by luck. This is not by luck, this is the, this, you know what this 50% means? It's something stupid, like this is the chance of getting 85 or more than 85, assuming the crash course does help. We don't, we don't care about that. that, that doesn't change anything. We don't care if it's 50%, whatever. We care about luck. What's the chance of getting this number by luck? So we have to assume that the crash course does nothing for the time being. So if it does nothing, we compare it to this. If we find the p-value here, it will be 2%. So now is 2% significant? Is the 2% significant? Yes, it is significant. It is significant, right? We all agree it's significant. So now do we accept H1 or H0? What do I put here next to it? H1, okay, we, we put H1. Now, we don't know the reality. I told you the reality. I told you the reality is that, you know, the, the crash course does help. Now, I'm gonna, do you, before I go one step further, do you all understand this? I wanna see some yeses or, or noes or yes, clear. Yes, 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 yes. So now you guys understand p-value, you guys understand that, you know, you guys understand a lot of things, but now it's time to be confusing again. And this is the last part of the concept. This is the, if you understand this, we close this lecture. It's just a few like 10 minutes extra worth of theory and stuff like this that already makes sense to you. Now, is it possible, is it possible that although I gave you the crash course, the average did not beat 80? Is it possible? What did I tell you when I always say, is it possible? You always say, yes, it is possible. So even though the reality is that the crash course does help you, let's say I, I picked you guys as my sample and your average was like 75, 75. So now we go and plug it into the here because we have to assume that it came from this population. You get it here. Is this significant? Answer, is this significant? Yes or no? It's not significant, right? You all can agree that it's not significant. So then, what will we say? Will we go with H0 or H1? The p-value will be something like maybe 30% or something. I don't know, like something like that. We will go with H0. So now, even though the reality, the reality is that the crash course does help you. And I'm telling you, the reality is that the crash course does help you. Um, we accepted the null hypothesis. So now this is the exact opposite. Here, the, 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 the drug doesn't work. Where is it, for example? The, the water doesn't work. But there's a moment where we think that it might work and that's called an alpha error. Here, the crash course does work, but we think it doesn't. So this is the opposite and that would be called a beta error, beta error. So you see how it's, it's all interlinked and it all depends on reality. What, what is reality? The problem is that we don't know what reality is most of the time, but here I'm just telling you it so that we can understand this example, okay? So now it's time to look at, yeah, yeah you got lost, it's fine, fine. 
it's time to look at the mind map. Okay. Now, what is the mind map? It's a very nice. Um, okay. And then here, like this. I will repeat it. This is something that I always recommend all of you draw whenever you get a question about alpha, beta, whatever, these types of questions, okay? So what is this drawing? Here, this entire distribution, the reality is that H is zero. You, the null hypothesis is true. This is the reality here. Here in this distribution, H1 is true, okay? Huda, look, you're really jumping. I'll talk about calculations right now, just concept, concept. I'll talk about calculations, just concept. Again, lean, you're jumping. Forget, I'll give you a million examples. Just focus on this mind map right now. Okay, so let's assume the reality is that the, the H0 is, is true. Let's say that this is the example of the water example. So there's two things that can happen. Either you get a mean that's here, which will be to the left of the significance points. Okay, this basically this line represents the 5%. If you get a mean beyond this, it will be significant. If you get a mean less than that, it will be not significant, okay? So if you get a mean here, and the reality is that the null hypothesis is true. Well, that's good. You wanna reject uh, your hypothesis. And the only way you can do that is if your p-value is very high. You will say, oh, the p-value is very high. So the null hypothesis is true. I will reject my hypothesis. So if you get a mean here, what will end up happening is you'll reject this and you'll accept this. And that's good. You want to do that. This example is when we did water, but we thought the water was not going to do anything, right? No, Faris, this would not be out there. This would be, this would be a, a correct decision. This is called a correct decision, okay? This is what you want to do when, you're, when you get a p-value and, and you, any, I need to erase this because now all of you are going to think that this x means that it's, oh, wait, where is it? Okay, so this is less than five, okay? And this is more than five. When it's more than five, you go to H0, you think of H0 as being true. When it's more than, when it's less than five, you think of H1 is true, right? You think of this. Now, let's, let's just live in this land for now, just this, this top land, okay? This top land where in reality, H0 is true. Let's live there for a minute. Just forget the bottom one. You can either get a mean to the left of this, right? And this would be called a correct decision. You would get a p-value greater than five, and you would think that, hey, we got a p-value greater than five, so it's not significant, so we'll accept the null hypothesis. And that's good because here in this land, the null hypothesis is true. That's the reality. If, however, you still live in this land where the, all, where the null hypothesis is true, that's the reality. The null hypothesis is true. The water doesn't work. The crash course doesn't work, blah, 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 blah. Um, then what would happen is, 5% of the time, this is fixed, fixed value. 5% of the time, you will land somewhere here where the p-value will be less than five. And you'll think, oh, less than five. Okay, so it's significant. So we'll go with the alternate hypothesis. Nope, this is wrong. You're making a mistake. You won't know that you're making a mistake because you don't know whether you're up here or down here, but I'm telling you right now that we're up here. So obviously this is a mistake. And this region, this region of the mind map is called alpha. So do you now just understand this top part? This is a correct decision. This is alpha. Do you just understand this part so far? We'll talk about the bottom part, but do you understand the top part so far? Yes, okay, all of you understand it. Now let's talk about the bottom part. If the alternate hypothesis in reality was true, then we're talking about everything down here. Now, if the p-value was less than five, then that's amazing, that's good. We will be here. We will think that the, uh, it's significant, the null hypothesis is wrong, our hypothesis is correct, and yada, 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 and that's a correct decision. Both of these are correct decisions, but this one, this one in particular, has a special name. This one's called power, power. You really need to understand this because 
people really care about power, okay? So if we, if we got a p-value less than five, then we'll say, oh, great, it's significant. We'll accept the alternate hypothesis. And here we'll think that, oh, in this land, the alternate hypothesis is true. An example of this would be the crash course. So for example, the crash course really does help you. And then we'll get a p-value. And just like back here, the p-value was like 80, 85. We'll get a, a p-value of 2%. And then basically you'll think, oh, hey, look, we got this value, 2% uh, p-value, significant alternate hypothesis is the way to go. So that, that would be a correct decision. But you know, since, since both of these are correct decisions, you give it in a special name, it's called power. The other one doesn't have a specific name. It's just called correct decision. And they're both called correct decisions, but the bottom one is really important. It's called power. But sometimes, even though the crash course can work, you can sometimes end up being here where the p-value will be greater than five. And you'll think, oh, greater than five, not significant. We're gonna go with the null hypothesis. But in this land down here, the null hypothesis is wrong. This hypothesis is true in reality. So you'd be making a mistake here. And that mistake is termed as beta. So one really, literally, any question you get immediately, draw two lines like this. Even on your step exam, I have a video on my YouTube channel about this. And I even give the same mind map. And every single time, I, uh, I didn't get a question on my stuff. You find some questions in your world about this, but uh, during my stuff one, I didn't get a question about it. I could have gotten a question about it, but I didn't. But if I did, I would have had this mind map ready because it helps you. So two lines, two lines, one distribution here, one distribution here. Draw the line. This is the significance value cut. This is alpha, this is beta, and this is power. This is H1. This is H0. This is the reality, right? This is reality. So all of this represents that the null hypothesis is, is true in reality. And all of this represents that the null hypothesis is false. Okay. So do you all get this? Do you, will you all promise me to you, please use this mind map so you don't get a question wrong during the, the, the final? Okay, you all understand it. All right, so we spent an hour on it. I think an hour is decent. I think an hour is great. Can we repeat it one last time? Of course. And I'm gonna go in detail with this one. So here is our first population. Here's our second. And then this is the distribution. This is the distribution. This is the cutoff for 5%. Anything beyond this is significant. Anything to the left of this is not significant. This is H0. And this is H1, right? So help me with this. I'll ask you and you guys tell me, what if we live in this, in this population? I tell you that in reality, the, all, the null hypothesis is true. In reality, the null hypothesis is true. And your p-value was not significant. Is that an error or is that, is that alpha, which is an error, or is that correct? Again, null hypothesis is true and your, your p-value was, was greater than 5%. That's a correct decision. Now, what if your p-value was less than five, but your null hypothesis is true? What example are we using? Well, I'm, I'm not giving you a specific example. I'm just telling you the questions, how they'll come, okay? So what if the p-value is less than five? So you think it's significant. You think that the alternate hypothesis is true, but in reality, I'm telling you, we're still here. We're still in this top mind map, the top area of the mind map, where in reality, the null hypothesis is true. And, uh, you, but you think it's not true. You'll, you'll, you'll be doing an alpha error. Alpha error, another way of saying it is that you think something works, but it doesn't. You think it works, but it doesn't, right? You, you, your p-value is less than five. So you think that it does work. You think, hey, this, this thing is true, but it doesn't, this, this is true. Now let's assume the alternate hypothesis is true. That's the reality. You can get either a p-value greater than five this way. So what, what would that be called? If your p-value is greater than five, but your alternate hypothesis is true. That will be called beta. You'd be making a mistake, right? And then the last one left is, is a p-value less than five, but your alternate hypothesis is true. This is like the crash course example that I gave you, right? And you get it right. This is called, but this is not called the correct decision. I mean, this is called the correct decision, but since both are called correct decisions, uh, generally the, the name you want to go for is power. Exactly. So this is power, right? That is the lecture in a nutshell. This one slide, if you literally understand it, 
so much of the theory goes behind it. Because now what we're going to talk about is, for example, what if this mean goes more like this? What happens to power? What if the uh, sample size increases? What happens to power? What if, for example, uh, the null hypothesis is true, but you rejected it. Where are you? If if the alternate hypothesis is rejected, uh, but you accept, but uh, but you accept. No, I didn't think of that. What if the alternate hypothesis is rejected, uh, but um, but your p-value is something? Like it, these are the questions that you're going to get. So you have to say, is it alpha? Is it beta? Is it power? Is it this? This one mind map solves all those problems, right? This one mind map does it. Just repeat beta error. So beta error is when you think. It doesn't work, does not work, but it does. So for example, like the crash course, you might get a value here, right? And the reason I'm using this bottom figure is because the crash course in reality does work, but you might get a value here and the p-value might be like something like 10%. And you would say, oh, 10%, so the null hypothesis is true. This is not significant, so the null hypothesis is true. But that's wrong. You, you think that it doesn't work, but it does. Sorry, but it does. So beta error is when your H1 seems to correlate. No, 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 no. Beta error is when you think the, the, the null hypothesis is true, but you're wrong, the alternate hypothesis is true. Did you get it? Yeah, it's, it's not when your H1 seems to correlate with H0. That, that, that sentence, it's not, it, uh, it doesn't make sense. That sentence doesn't make sense. It's, it's when you think that the null hypothesis is true, but it's not. It's the H1 that's true. That's a beta error. Okay? So that's the entire lecture. That's the entire lecture. You, got, you, you guys understood it in an hour. But we still have a bit more theory. So if null in reality is true, and P is more than 5, is it considered correct decision? Yes. If, if the null in reality is true. If this is true, but the P value is greater than 5, and that means you're here. You're here. You're in this region. So that's called the correct decision. And he loves asking like this. So he will, for example, give you maybe like four different questions in your final, and it'll be like this. It'll be like, okay, you know what? Well, and even if you like happen to want more examples, I mentioned, uh, just, just go to my YouTube channel and go to that video, skip to the, like, like the last two minutes. I go over this mind map and I give more examples, like two or three examples about this. So I'm, I'm gonna give you guys examples. You can draw, I'm gonna keep going back to this mind map so you can use it, but I'm gonna keep giving you more examples. So. Okay, so I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna speak it. I'm just gonna speak it, okay? So or I, I will write it. So, so I'll go here. So rejecting H0 when it is true. Rejecting H, H0 when it's true. What is that? I'll go back to the mind map. Right, so when you reject H0, it means you're on this side, right? So it's either alpha or power. But no, we said that H0 is true, so it's gotta be alpha. You see, this is where the mind map really helps you. And this is how the question will come. It'll tell you, we rejected the, the, the null hypothesis, but it's true. Yeah, it's the luck one, it's the luck one, exactly. But even, don't say it's the luck one, because even beta, even beta error is built upon luck, right? All right, so let's give you another example. Let's say accepting the alternate hypothesis when it is wrong. Accepting the alternate hypothesis when it's wrong. So you accepted H1, but it's wrong. All right, so someone said beta. Let's go back to the mind map. Let's go back to the mind map. The guys who said alpha, you're right. So what did I say? Accepting H1 when it's wrong. So when we say accepting H1, you know, we think H1 is right. So we're, we're on this side, we're on this side, right? But, but now the problem is, is it alpha or is it power, right? Because the only way we can accept H1, the only way we can accept H1 is that the P value has to be less than five, meaning that we have to be beyond this, this area. This is the only way we can accept H1. But is H1 true or not true? I said, I said accepting H1, but it's wrong. So if it's wrong, that means that we're only left with alpha. So it's still alpha. You see how we can flip two different questions? Uh, there's one thing I, I will mention. And this is sort of a grammar thing. If you see not rejecting, just change it to accepting. It's easier on the tongue and easier for you to understand. That's at least what I used to do. And if you see like not rejecting or not accepting, just change it to rejecting. That's easier to understand. Basically remove the not if you can, remove the not. Okay, so let's, let's give you another example. Let's forget about what this said. So you accepted the null hypothesis when it's true. 
accepting the null hypothesis when it's true. All right, so it should be a correct decision. Where was that in the mind map? You accepted the null hypothesis. Okay, but is it true? Oh yeah, it is true. So we're on this side. We're on this side here. And that's called the correct decision. So what is... Uh, rejecting H1, you rejected H1, but it's true. You rejected H1, but it's true. Exactly, so this is beta. So you rejected H1, so you're on this side, you're on the left side, since p-value has to be greater than five for you to reject H1, but it was true, it was the correct decision. It, it, this side was the correct in, in reality. So you made a mistake, so what, what mistake is that? That has to be beta, right? So is it? So when is it true, we go for the left side. Left side will like, look, you can use this mind map however way you want. The way I use it is first I determine whether he wants alpha or power or beta versus correct decision. Another way you can do it is you first dictate whether H1 is true or H0 is true. You can, any, it's up to you. Like, I'll, I'll show you another example. Let's say um, rejecting H1 or no. Yeah, rejecting H1 when it's false. Rejecting H1 when it's false. So, okay. I'll do I'll do the other way. So rejecting H1 when it's false. Okay, H1 is false, so this is true. So it's either this here or alpha, right? So rejecting H1, since we said rejecting H1, then it means we have to be on the left side, not the right side. So it's, it's correct decision. So it's up to you how to use this mind map. I personally like to first find right or left, then up or down, all right? You can do it up or down, then right or left. It's, it's how you want to do it. Basically, it's, it's this. It's alpha, beta, uh, and then here is power. And then... This bottom area is H1. This top area is H0. This left area means that p-value is greater than 5%. This right area means that p-value is less than 5%. So this is what the mind map is kind of trying to say, but I like drawing it like this with the two distributions. I feel like it's a lot easier for me to understand. If you, if you prefer this table, go ahead, go for it, but I prefer the distributions. So accepting null hypothesis when it is true, correct decision. But accepting null hypothesis when it's false is beta error. Yes, accepting null hypothesis when it's false is beta error, correct? But accepting null hypothesis, because you, you'd be here. Accept, you'd be accepting this. Where the hell is my mouse? You'd be accepting this, but it's false. So you're here. You're making a mistake. You're here. You're at beta. So you see lots of, lots of ways he can, he can uh, mess with this, right? So do you all understand this? If alternate hypothesis is true and P is more than 5%, it's power. No, if no, because remember, P value being more than 5% means that you're on the left side. P value being more than 5%, you're on the left side. So there's no way you're power. Just get that out of your mind. There's no way you're power. What did you ask? Where, where is the person who asked? You guys are asking way too much. Wait. Was it Sada? Was it, were you the one who asked? Accepting the null hypothesis when it is false is a beta. You guys are asking way too many questions. Please repeat the power, please. Okay. So power is when you accept H1, but it's true. You accept H1, so you're down here, and it's true. So you're on this side. You're on the right side. Or p-value is less than 5%, and you accept the H1. This is all power. Okay? Do I have a cleaner mind map? Are you all understanding this, or is it still... Do you just understand the basics of it? When I reject, wait, stop, stop, stop. When I reject, oh my God, no, guys, guys, wait. When I reject, okay, this is ML's question. I'm gonna take them one by one. When I reject the null hypothesis, when it's false, what would it be? That would be power as well, because you're just flipping what I'm saying. If I tell you accepting the, the alternate hypothesis when it's true, it's the same as uh, rejecting the null hypothesis when it's false. Same words, just, you know, different words, just same answer, you know? So that, that would be power for ML. So let me see what, other people are yeah it's confusing I, I agree it is very confusing when you first start out but this should be something yeah and you literally on this this mind map clears everything and this should be something and literally this question does not deserve more than 30 seconds honestly even during step exam does not deserve more than 30 seconds okay how is it the same so let me go back to your question i'm gonna, I'm gonna use the mind map so when i reject okay so i'm gonna write them here for you rejecting uh the null hypothesis when it is also false, okay? 
So let me go back to the mind map. Rejecting the null hypothesis. So we're not here, you know, or sorry, rejecting the null hypothesis, we're on the right side. When it's false, when it's false, that means H1 is true. So it has to be power, we're down here. The alternate way of saying it is accepting H1 when it's true. So accepting H1, it means you're on the right side. And then when you say it's true, it means you're on the bottom part, so it's power, right? Basically, when you say I accept I accepted H1, it means the p-value has to be significant. Because there's no way you can accept the null hypothesis, for example, and the p-value is not significant. And there's no way for you to any any look at you cannot say, you cannot say, I accept the null hypothesis, but the p-value is significant. No, 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 no. When the p-value is not significant, it means you accepted the null hypothesis. When the p-value is significant, it means you accepted H1. Okay. Now, your next step is finding out whether which one is reality. So, for example, I accepted H1, so p-value is less than 5, but H0 is true. That would be, an, for example, alpha error. That would be an alpha error because, you know, I, I told you that we're accepting H1. We, we think that it works, but it doesn't. So that's alpha error. So I, I know this is very confusing. So p less than 5, alternate is true, so it's power. That is true now, yeah. Yeah, if, so if P is less than five, in other words, you accepted H1, and it is also, and H1 is also true, then that would be a power. Will this be the wording of the question? Yeah, this could be the wording of the question. The only way he might like trick you is by saying, hey, we, and this is how, um, just guys, stop, uh, stop asking for a second, because there are way too many questions right now. Just uh, hold your question. When I go through everything, then we can like ask one. But this is how he can sometimes trick you. This is usually like steps. They don't ask stuff like this. They don't ask you a one a one liner question telling you, oh hey, well, p value blah blah blah. They don't, they don't ask like that. Like the way I'm asking right now. What they do is they give you 20 lines and they give you a study, right? They give you a study and you they try and make you waste as much time as you want. What you're supposed to do is go to the bottom part, the bottom last question, last uh, sentence, and then it's gonna say something like, what's the chance that this drug worked? But it doesn't. Or it's, it's going to tell you, for example, uh, like it will tell you. I don't know. Like I don't know how to phrase the question right now. But the idea is that they give you all of this humongous piece of text, and then at the end they're like, uh, "But they found out that they accepted that the drug works when it actually didn't. What's the chance of this happening?" And then you just say, "Oh, it's five percent," because they're asking about alpha. You get it? So he might ask you a question similar to this. He tells you that a study was conducted and they found out that the drug works. Uh, later, five, five studies after you found, found, later found out that the drug doesn't work, what was the chance that the first study made a mistake? The answer is 5%. So he sometimes might make it direct and you can quickly answer it like this, like using the mind map. Sometimes he, make, he twists it a little, a little and then you have to like really think about the question, right? And you have to think about uh, what exactly is it. So let's, let me go through the questions now. So uh, I asked, I answered not one. Now it's Osama. Will the wording, yeah, I answered you. Uh, okay, now it's Hamza. Rejecting H1 when it's true is beta. Rejecting H1, yeah, if you, rejecting H1 when you're here, you'll be here on this side. So it's either this or beta. When H1 is true, so you'll, that means you're at the bottom part, you're at beta, so you're right. Accepting H0 when it is false is still beta. Accepting this, when it's false, is still beta. Yeah, because you're gonna, when you say I accepted the null hypothesis, it's the same thing as saying I'm on the left side. And then you're saying that this is this is true by saying that this is false, right? So then it'll be beta. Uh, right side is accepting, left is rejecting. Do not think of it like that. Think of it that right the right side, it means you accepted the, the alternate hypothesis. The left side means that you uh, accepted the, um, the null hypothesis. You can flip it. You can say that the left side is the, if you're on the left side, that means you rejected the, the uh, alternate hypothesis and you accepted the null hypothesis, right? So left side means that null hypothesis is true. Right side means uh, alternate hypothesis. Uh, sorry, sorry, no, no. Left, it doesn't mean true, it doesn't mean true. It does not mean true, forget true. Left side means you accepted the null hypothesis. Could be true, could be not true. Right side means you accepted the alternate hypothesis, could be true, could be not true, right? And based on whether it's true or not true, you then complete the mind map and find out the answer. Okay, one more question, falsely rejecting null hypothesis. So you falsely rejected null hypothesis. So you were supposed, okay, okay. 
falsely rejecting it. So we, we understand that it's supposed to be true. So we're up here, we're up here. Now you falsely rejected it. That means you made a mistake. You were supposed to accept it. So that means it's alpha, you get it? So that means it's alpha. Again, you just have to think uh, with these questions using the mind map. All right. So if alternate hypothesis is true and P is more than five, it's beta error. So if alternate hypothesis is true and P more than five, yeah, you're right. If, if your alternate hypothesis is true, so you're down here, but your P value is more than five, that means you, you accepted the null hypothesis, so you made a mistake. Uh, so that'd be your, your beta error. Okay. I think, you know, tomorrow you're probably going to try and remember these and it's going to be very, very uh, fading in your memory. So what I recommend is, can you draw the table form, please? Yeah, sure, I can draw the table form. So it's like this, this, and then the table depends. This is why I do not like using the table. The table depends on you remembering that this part is H0, this entire part up here is H0, and this entire part down here is H, uh, H1. So you might say, oh, but it's the same thing in the mind map. No, the mind map, like it, when, you, when you draw the distributions, it makes more sense than just memorizing. Whatever, whatever. Point is, if you want the table, this is the table. Basically, this is correct decision. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I name it C. This is alpha, right? This is going to be beta. And this is going to be uh, power, right? So this is the table form. And remember, left here, all these things here are going to be P more than five. So you accepted the null hypothesis. Doesn't say anything about whether it's true or not. The, that the question has to say it. And then if it's on the right side, basically alpha and power, that means you rejected the null hypothesis. You accepted the alternate hypothesis. But it depends. Is it which one is true? Then you make your answer, right? So that's the table form. I personally like the the distribution. They're, they're, they're the same essentially. It's just preference. So that's, that's the lecture. You see how we finished the lecture without even looking at the lecture. Actually, we didn't finish the lecture. We have, uh, we have uh, theory. We have theory. Where is, all right, then back to Zoom and share screen, share this. All right, before we talk about theory, I think this is a nice time to pray. <laughs> right, yeah, can we take a break to pray before continuing? Of course, I think this is a beautiful time to take a break. So let's meet at 7.20, 10 minute break, okay? 7.21, 10 minute break, okay? 7.21, all right? Let's pray. Don't call me a doctor. <laughs> All right, ask. Okay. The hand, there's this question, I think it's from last year or something. Oh, sorry, I wrote it down. What is the, P, uh, the probability of me? Teaching kids about the null hypothesis. Oh, wh wh why are they teaching them about null hypothesis? I remember reading a study that conclusively disproved it. The joke is that how do you disprove it? You have to use the null hypothesis, right? So, yeah, yeah. I know it's not the best joke. But it's, it gets the point across. That we use the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. Sometimes, you know, maybe the chance of this happening by luck is 2%. So we would say, hey, the drug works because the chance of this happening by, by luck alone is 2%. So H1 is true. Therefore, we would say that this drug works, right? But to find this 2%, we had to assume that it didn't work just for a little bit. We had to assume it didn't work to find out this 2%. So now he's saying, oh, what if three get better, two get, two, uh, we get better from this group, blah, 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 blah. He's saying we need a way to calculate it, yada, yada, yada. Pro the p-value is the probability of a, we, we saw this in the probability lecture, probability of a result or, you know, uh, or beyond that result, assuming the null hypothesis is true. This is all good. This is how we calculated it. This is combination. You don't need to, uh, let's just skip it, skip it. We don't need to know this. So do we reject the null hypothesis? Of course, because it's less than 0 0.5. We talked about all of this. This is all the same stuff. Uh, this is really important because you know we need a sample, we take statistics, yada, yada, yada. We, we basically have an idea from the sample about the population, then we can you know, start making changes to the population. Like if we take a sample and we find out that the drug is good, and now, then we don't need to take any more samples. But whoever comes in your clinic that belongs to this population, just give them the drug. So this is why we do all of this. This is why we do hypothesis testing. Uh, can the null can the null be that a certain drug works, for example, and the alternative is that it doesn't? Oh, is that all? Well, I do not understand the question at all. <laughs> I'm really sorry. 
can the null hypothesis be that a certain drug works, for example? Oh, oh my God. You know what? Thought up. You jumped like 20 steps ahead. It is a beautiful question. Okay. No, no, no. No, no, no. Don't cry because your question is really nice. You know, this is the portion of, of, the, of the lecture where people start asking this. And I'm really happy you asked me because it's a really good question. Now, I will give the answer very quickly, but we'll talk about this more when we get to it. Since alpha is always locked at 5%, um, and beta is not locked to a specific portion, we don't actually flip the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. We don't start working backwards. In fact, the reason we first find out p-value from the null hypothesis is because of this. Because, and I, I, I talk a lot about this in my Twitter, uh, on my Twitter. Shout out to my Twitter. Point is, uh, I made a, I made a, uh, I don't know if I got what they call it. It's, any, it's like a series of tweets that is about medicine. Basically, I, I answered the question of why do we answer, why do we first disprove the null hypothesis? Why don't we start the opposite way? Why don't we, why don't we just start with the alternate hypothesis? The answer lies in this alpha and beta. Basically, if we did it the way you wanted us to do it, uh, you know, alternate hypothesis first, then null hypothesis at the bottom. Uh, then what would happen is we would have a lot of studies that are just wrong, right? By ensuring that we have alpha, you know, alpha is our 5%, which is less than 20%, we ensure that there will be less studies that are incorrect, right? We ensure that there are less studies that are incorrect. And we will talk about this more. Basically, when there is, for example, uh, let's say, you, uh, first disproving the null hypothesis or first disproving the alternate hypothesis, which one is better? Basically, whichever one has more detrimental effects, we assign alpha to it. Now, obviously, having more studies that are incorrect is more damaging than missing out on a few good studies. I know that sounds like very confusing, but basically that answers why the null hypothesis is, is taking alpha, not the opposite way around. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, talk about this more. Basically, whichever effect will possibly lead to a more detrimental outcome, we assign that to alpha because we want to minimize that bad outcome. And the only way we can minimize that bad outcome is by setting alpha to it because alpha is less than beta. The chance of alpha happening is less than beta. Right? So did you kind of, did you all get this idea? Because we'll talk about it more. If you didn't get it, it'll, it'll come up soon. No, yes, uh, no. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll talk about it soon. So basically, this is everything that we already talked about, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, because beta is always bigger. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it could be smaller, but very, very, very least. So we just say almost always so it's, it's bigger. So this is everything that we talked about. This is like nothing new. Every, all of this we've talked about, it, okay? When you come to this slide and you just read it, it's everything that we talked about. Like, let us say comparing two means, the null hypothesis says that both means are close to zero, meaning that they're both on top of each other, yada, yada, yada. If we repeat it, is it safe to say that a beta error is safer than an alpha error? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, usually, like, let's say there are two mistakes that can happen. Uh, yeah, safer. You're correct by saying safer. I, I, I wouldn't say that beta is the safe error, but it's at least safer than the mistake that could happen with alpha error, right? This is why we assign the null hypothesis to alpha. And you, you can go read the tweet. It's not, it's not, I only have like 100 tweets. I'm not like you guys who literally post thousands upon thousands upon thousands of tweets. So you, you can just go onto my profile and you can go read it if you want to read more about it. Because it's, it's really, um, like it's one of those concepts that doesn't really help you in the exam, but it's kind of good for understanding more about this, about this concept. So. You can go and read that if you want, but any to get a bit of a better understanding. If the drug does not work, but we rejected the null hypothesis. If the drug does not work, yeah. So the drug doesn't work, but you thought it worked. You rejected the null hypothesis. This would be an alpha error. You'd be the top right portion. Okay, so this is the uh, same exact thing. I'm telling you, hey, these are the limits. If you go beyond the limits, you reject the null hypothesis. If you are inside the limits, it is you know uh, uh, normal. It is, it is you accept the null hypothesis. Or you know how he likes to say it, you do do not reject the null hypothesis, which is the same as accept the null hypothesis. Okay, and then he talks about Jamovi a lot. For us, it was our studio. Then for the previous batch, it was Excel. Then for you guys, it's Jamovi. I, I'm not. I, I don't. I don't know Jamovi. See, this is the mind map. This is the mind map that I was talking about. This is why I like to use it because I learned. Uh, he, he actually like like I didn't understand this alone. I used to ask him a lot of questions, and he taught it to me using this mind map. 
Because Dr. Peter, يعني, he's honestly a very knowledgeable doctor. He's incredibly knowledgeable when it comes to biceps. It's just that if he sees that the class isn't paying attention, he just goes over like as if you guys understand. He doesn't care to like stop everyone and make sure that all of you understand. No, he just, if you guys don't want, don't want to understand, he doesn't care. But if you actually go to him and ask him about this, he'll explain it to you in a perfect way. And uh, yeah, and this is how I first learned it. And he explained it to me in a similar fashion to this. And that's how I, I, I can explain it to you. So Annie, if, if, uh, if there's ever something, I will mention this in the next lecture. There's something I don't know. Like for example, all this Jamovi stuff, I don't know it. So uh, I know how to see the results from it because I know how to interpret the results. But if there are specific techniques, I'm going to tell you to go ask Dr. Peter about it because I, I don't know about these stuff. Uh, the, or these things. So this is the this is the uh, the mind map. Now we're now we're getting into the theory. Now we're getting into the theory. So what if we decrease alpha? If we decrease alpha, we actually increase beta. Now this is not acceptable. Most journalists accept only 0.05. Even if you say, oh, but alpha is is uh, you know 0.01. Why why are you rejecting it? Because you're affecting beta. They, they don't want this. You're basically you're decreasing power. Look, your power here is only around 40%. Imagine, imagine your power here is 50%. Yeah, type 1 is alpha, type 2 is beta. Imagine your power here is 50%. You, you know what 50% means? Just to put it into perspective. It's better to flip a coin to see if you're going to find the difference. It's better to honestly flip a coin than, than doing the study. Just, you know, don't, don't do the study. Just flip a coin. Oh, if it's heads, okay, uh, drug works. If it's, not, if it's tail, drug doesn't work. Because that's how crazy it is. You need a power around 80%, not 50. 50% is terrible. It's like flipping a coin to find out whether your study works or, or whether your, the drug works or doesn't work, right? If, if it does work, finding that difference is power. So if it's 50%, you have a 50% chance of missing it, missing it. Here it's even worse. Here it's close to like 40%. So that's why even if your alpha is really low, you, you really want to impress them. You're, uh, my alpha is 0 0.1 or 0 0.01, uh, they will tell you, no, this is not acceptable because you're, you've decreased your power. So in the exam, if he tells you, if we increase alpha, uh, what happens to beta? You all should say it increases. And the opposite is, tr if, is true. If your alpha is here, your beta has to, has to decrease, right? So alpha and beta are opposite to each other, okay? And this, and this should make sense to you. Another thing that increases, another thing that makes power better is basically this mean. The mean makes it better. The more the mean goes this way, the higher your power becomes. So the further away the mean is, the higher your power becomes. And that should make sense to you from the confidence interval lecture. If the effect size is very big, like I, I, I was showing it to you guys. When, when I tell you, is the effect size good here? All you're saying, yes. I'm telling you, is it significant? You, you're all saying yes. And the reason you're all saying yes is because the effect size is so big that the, the power is so large. If there was a difference, you would find it, right? So if he tells you, if we increase the mean, what happens to power? You should all say increase. If he tells you that we decrease the mean, what happens to power? You should all say decrease. If he tells you, uh, for example, we increase, uh, I, I don't think they have, I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit. If he tells you we increase N, what happens to power? It also increases. Remember, because it got narrower, notice how the beta here is much bigger, but here the beta is much smaller. So power, is the opposite to beta, it goes up. And look, I'm not gonna do all of this again for beta. Basically, whatever happens to power, the opposite happens to beta. So always think of everything in terms of power. In terms of power. So for example, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask all of you this. If we increase the mean, what happens to beta? If we increase the mean, what happens to beta? Beta should decrease, excellent, okay. If we uh, get a higher sample size, what happens to power? Increase. You see, you don't need to know this theory. You don't need, to, I don't need to sit here and tell you what happens to this, what happens to that. You already understand through all the principles we already made, right? So, but now you know, you know, if we increase the mean, we, we increase power. If we increase the sample size, we increase power. Right? And alternatively, beta decreases. If we increase alpha, beta decreases and power, inc power sorry, if we, inc if we decrease alpha, beta increases and power decreases, right? If we decrease alpha, Beta will increase and power will decrease. You see, it's just about thinking during the moment. It's, it, there's not really something to understand from these other than understanding the theory behind them, right?
So let's keep going. This was the table I'm talking about. He makes it a bit different. He Because again, he, he puts the H0 being true and H0 being false on different axes. Basically, it's the same table. You can use this table if you want. How would increasing the sample size increase the power? Because you make them narrower. I just talked about it. Look, you go to this. Notice how this, the only difference between this top area and this bottom area is, is the N. When you increase the sample size, these become narrower. Therefore, there is less of an intersection between them. It's the same as, as pushing them away from each other. It's just that instead of pushing them away using the means, we push them away by making each one narrower. So there's less of an intersection. So therefore, beta will decrease and power will increase. Does this make sense? Faris, does this make sense? Yeah, OK. All right, perfect. Sorry, because uh, you asked me this private, privately. No one saw your question. OK, point is, point is. You all understand this, okay? So now, the only remaining real concept is this idea of alpha versus beta. Now, look, this is, uh, oh my God, I remember this, because every time I explain this, I always get people shouting, telling me that this is not how it should be. Look, what, what do people say in America? You are innocent until proven. Can you guys complete the sentence? Innocent until proven guilty, right? innocent until proven guilty, right? So you might think this is stupid, but this is how it really works in America. They care more. They, they think this is more detrimental. They do not want, like there are two mistakes that can happen. Either you send an innocent man to jail. In other words, you falsely charge him for something uh, or you let a guilty man walk free. Now I know all, what you're all thinking. Letting a guilty man walk free is worse than letting an innocent man go into jail. No, it's actually in, in a, with American law, with American law, it's the opposite. It's innocent until proven guilty. They care more about not putting an innocent man into jail than having a guilty person walk free. For that reason, which one should be alpha? Alpha should be the one where you falsely charge the person. And beta should be the one where you don't press charges despite him being guilty. Did you get this idea? It should never be the opposite because you're going to be sending more innocent people to jail than catching more guilty people. Instead, it should be the opposite. The more detrimental action, again, this is controversial. People will say, no, it's more detrimental for letting the guilty people walk free. But no, I'm telling you the reality of the American law system. We can argue Again, the problem that people don't understand this is they say, no, no, sending it, forget the controversial aspect to it. I'm telling you, if it's if you if you put an innocent man into jail, it's worse than letting a guilty man walk free. This is the okay, the law is this. The law, this is very simple of it. It's he, the person is innocent until proven guilty. So if he's innocent, the last thing they want happening is putting him in jail. They don't ever say you're guilty and you have to prove your innocence. No, because then they're going to send many people who are innocent to jail. That's going to be our beta. We don't want that as our beta. The American law. So alpha means the innocent is convicted. And exactly. Or he, the innocent is falsely charged. The innocent is like has to pay a fine or has to be sent to jail or whatever. That's our alpha. Because with, with the American law, they care more about sending an innocent person to jail than they do about letting a guilty man walk free. And I personally, I agree with this. I, any, you can call it whatever you want. Saying this, I, I like it, it put, put yourself in their shoes. If you're, if you're innocent, do you want to go to jail? I would be fine if there's a guilty man walking free, but I would not be fine if many people who are innocent uh, go, go to jail, right? Because like, imagine you're, you're a doctor and you're fine. You're not doing anything wrong. Something happened and they're accusing you. And then, yeah, then everyone would be, you know, I, I don't like using everyone, but the, comparatively, there will be more people going to jail that are innocent than there are people guilty going to jail. You don't get it, lol. Okay. Okay, okay, look. There are four outcomes. Now, two are whatever. Innocent are free. That's great. That's our correct decision. We have guilty going to jail. That's also great. That's our correct decision. Sometimes problems can happen. Problems can happen. Innocent people can go to jail. That's a mistake. We don't want innocent people going to jail. He's innocent. Innocent. Do you guys know what innocent versus guilty means? Innocent means he did not commit a, a crime. Innocent means he's, he didn't do anything wrong. Guilty means they did do something wrong. They murdered someone or they stole from someone or they did something like that. So the entire idea is that 
we have two possible mistakes that can happen. An innocent man going to jail or a guilty man walking free. Now, the question is, which one is more detrimental? And I'm already giving you the answer. It's that the innocent man gets charged. This is the answer. Okay, and since that is more detrimental, that is our alpha. It's not the guilty man walking free, it's fine. If we have like 100 people who are guilty and 20 walk free, that's fine, okay? If I have uh, 100 innocent people, but only five get jailed, that's better than having 20 get jailed. So alpha, the 5% is my, is my innocent getting you know, jailed, but guilty walking free is my beta. Does that make sense? And I was using beta as 20% and alpha as 5% just for that example. Does that make sense to everyone? Again, this is really important because he might give you a question that why did we assign alpha to the falsely charged? I, okay, because two types of mistakes can happen. One is more detrimental than the other. So I, I want Sada to answer this. What is the more detrimental mistake? Which mistake is worse? Which error is worse? Falsely sending a man who was innocent, did not commit the crime to jail or putting the guilty man, the guilty man, into uh, or free, he, he's free. Which is worse? The first one, exactly, charging an innocent man. So because of that, we make alpha that mistake because alpha is only five percent. We want we don't want that to be very high. Guilty free is beta, exactly. Guilty free is beta, exactly. So does this make sense? So alpha is yeah. So alpha is more dangerous than beta. That's that's why alpha. In this case, I don't say it's more dangerous. And I would say that we want to minimize that mistake because it's more detrimental. It's, it has a worse outcome. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, so yeah, and you're right. Alpha is the more dangerous. Yeah, so I, I, I hope you all understood this. Now, let me give you some more examples. Here, for example, notice that they, they made a test. And ideally, you want the test to look like this, where everyone who's supposed to be an amazing, successful surgeon passes and everyone who's supposed to be a bad surgeon not successful in, in his career he's going to not pass the test unfortunately sometimes sorry sometimes there will be some people who are not successful but they pass the test that's going to be the alpha now do you want a not an unsuccessful surgeon who doesn't know how to cut doesn't know how to do this do you want them to pass the exam no that's going to be look maybe you have a successful surgeon but he failed the exam Fine, I don't care about that guy. Like, I know it's bad, haram, whatever, I don't care about that. I do not want an unsuccessful surgeon who passed the exam operating on me. That's why that's our alpha, because that's more dangerous. Do we always want to win? No, no, no. Alpha is always less than beta. So, yeah, I mean, the entire idea is that, please repeat. Okay, I'll, 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 repeat, I'll, repeat, I'll repeat. Just relax. Because someone said, do we always want to minimize alpha? Yes, you always want to. Alpha is already minimized. It's just the idea, the idea, look, guys, the idea is this. Didn't we say there's an alpha error and a beta error? All right. So I, I'd like to just tell all of you that we have 30 minutes or like 45 minutes left. And we are still in the second lecture. So definitely we're not going to be finishing by 8.30. Uh, and we'll see how, how much. No, Faris, look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, Faris, you're right. We don't want an innocent to be punished. That's why we give it the 5% because that will happen very few of the time. Do you want to give it to the beta? To the beta? Like, like look, look, if we flip, let's, let's take it as alpha first. If we have 100 innocent people, if it's alpha, it's going to be 5% who are innocent but get jailed. If we flipped it and made the alpha the beta, then if we have 100 innocent, 20 would get jailed. We don't want that happening. So instead we make it alpha. Did you get that? Yeah, we give it, the, the more dangerous outcome is given to alpha because we want less of that happening. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But we want less of that happening. Yeah, therefore, the null hypothesis is falsely rejected. Yeah, the, the, the null hypothesis in that case was that the innocent, you know, didn't do the crime. So you're going to say the alpha will be, he did do the crime, but he's innocent. So you're sending him off to jail, right? So that, that's the idea of that. I don't want you to think of it like that. Just think of, understand that. Alpha is less than beta. Just understand that that idea, okay? So, in this example, this is another example. Look, it's the same exact example. The only difference, look, they're here. There are four outcomes, okay? Two of which are correct decisions. I'll tell you them. The not successful surgeon fails. The successful surgeon passes, okay? Now, 
what do you think is worse? Again, what do you think is worse? An unsuccessful surgeon passing or a successful surgeon failing? What do you think is worse? Unsuccessful passing, because if he's unsuccessful, he's going to pass, he's going to get his license, and he's going to start killing people right? because he's unsuccessful. That's why the alpha is these people. He, it's the non, not successful that actually pass the exam. These guys, these guys right here. Did you get it? The other one can be the beta. Okay, it's fine. We'll have like 20 people that, um, you know, uh, are, are successful, but failed. It's fine. 20 people, uh, whatever, out of 100. But I don't, but, but I, and what I want is 100 unsuccessful, only five passing. I don't want more than that because they're going to go kill people, right? So that's why alpha here is that. Now let's take another example. When you're producing an aortic valve, okay? When you're producing an aortic valve, okay? Now, four things can happen. Now, first off, either you make a good aortic valve or a bad aortic valve, right? So it's just the, the company as a factory. Sometimes you make good stuff, sometimes you make bad stuff. Now, whenever you make a good aortic valve, you want to sell it, you want to give it to people, right? Whenever you make a bad aortic valve, you want to throw it away, get rid of it, or, or refix it or whatever, right? So uh, throw it out, right? Sometimes mistakes can happen. Sometimes a good aortic valve will be thrown away. Sometimes a bad aortic valve will be given to a patient. Which one is worse? Throwing away the good valve or giving the patient the bad valve? The second, the bad valve being given. Therefore, for that reason, the bad one passing is our alpha because we want that to be minimized. We don't want bad valves going to all the people. We want to go into a very minimized amount of people. Ideally, we should be to a zero, you know, zero people. No one should get it, but yeah, no one can guarantee that. But basically, if we throw away a good valve, if the good valve fails, add it, we'll, we'll leave it as our beta. But here, we can't afford giving bad valves to our patients. So with that, for that reason, it's alpha. Yeah, wait, we need to decide which is bad for the exam. Okay, yeah, look, 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 no, no, no. Uh, you don't, you don't. But he'll ask you, uh, um, he'll ask you theory about this. So he'll tell you, for example, um, why was this decision given alpha? So that's theory. He'll, he'll put in the choice, for example, to minimize that effect. Uh, he won't ask you, for example, set up alpha here because that's too controversial, you know? Like similar to the, uh, the innocent being charged. Like I, I think any, many people like disagree on this, sending the ideas there, the ideas there. Now, what about you make uh, doormats? Now doormats, you don't care if a bad doormat goes to your, to your customer, whatever, give them a bad doormat. What, what's important for you is maximizing profits, right? So, you know, if, if a good one gets sold, that's great. If a bad one, you throw it away, that's great. But there are two mistakes that can happen. Either you give a good one or, or um, you, you give a bad one to your customer, or you throw away a good one. Now you want to minimize throwing away good one because you want to maximize profit. So here you want to put alpha as the good one that fails because again, like you want to maximize profit. You don't care if, if the bad one passes. Oh, man, let's leave that as beta. Let's give him the bad one. I don't care. I want to make money. So notice how it's the exact same example. It's just flipped. What is alpha is you give the, you give the patient um, uh, the, the bad valve uh, sorry, one, yeah, this is the doormat. The, the aortic valve, giving the patient the bad valve is your alpha because you want to minimize that. You don't care about profit in this sense as much as the patient's well being. But here it's a doormat, whatever. Uh, give him a bad one. You want to maximize profit. That's why our alpha here is producer's risk. So again, this is just the idea that alpha is less than beta, yada, yada, yada. This is another, another uh, curve, another table, same principle. Again, statistical power, blah, 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 blah. blah. If the mean is greater, then basically, you know, this is the same exact thing that we're talking about, right? True state of the world. Again, if the mean is greater, then you know the, you have beta and power. What if we increase statistical uh, significance? Or you know, what, what if we increase the mean? You have decreasing beta. We talked about this. What if you may increase the size? We talked about this. Okay, then statistical power. So what is statistical power? It's the probability of making or getting the correct. You know, uh, it's the probability of getting or detecting significance if it is present.
So it is the probability of detecting significance, physical significance, assuming the, the alternate hypothesis is true, right? So this is important. So you all understand this. This is definition. It's the definition. Right, uh, an easier way and more positive way of thinking about it is correctly getting a significant result. Okay, wait, this is missing. Um, this is missing a little sentence because, or actually, no, 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 he, he got it right because you can't be significant with the top, right? If we draw this, look, if we draw this and then we draw this. He said correctly getting a significant result. So since he said significant, it's to the right and correctly, then it's power, right? So this definition is good. So again, this is just, we talked about all of this. This is all good. This is type two is this, yada, yada, yada. Power is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis, assuming that it's already false. So this is the same exact thing. He might bring you this notation. So memorize it, be good with this, right? Instead of bringing you, for example, words, he might just bring you this. So you have to know how to read this. I'll just quickly, you, you guys remember how to read this? I'll go over it. So the first one, is the probability of that thing happening such that this little thing is called such that. So it's like a condition. Uh, this is conditional probability such that this is already true. So what's the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis, assuming that the null hypothesis is false? And this is the correct decision. Specifically, it is power. And that's the exact definition of power. So be good with this notation. He gives you ways of calculating power, Jamovi, yada, 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 factors that affect it. Basically, the mean, we talked about this, the, how large the effect size is, blah, 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 increasing. And in general, you know, we have the most control. Like, you can't change the sample mean, right? You just collect data, and then there you go. There's your sample mean. You can't change it. But with the sample size, you can change it. Another thing is by decreasing the variability. This is similar to increasing the n. When you increase the n, the curves become narrower and basically cause uh, less, uh, less of an intersection between the two, de thus decreasing beta and increasing power. Four, by increasing alpha, but this is not generally good, right? Uh, by increasing alpha, you will decrease beta and increase power, but this is not really that important because no one really accepts it. The particular test employed. So some tests have better power, right? And this is something uh, that you will learn across medicine, right? This is something that you learn more in third year. And the entire idea is that there are some factors that affect power and the particular test that you employ, like a teeth test or ANOVA or man with me U test or the Bonferroni test or this test or that test or that test. All of these are different tests or this chi-square test. There are so many different tests that you can do and all of them sort of have different powers, different advantages, different disadvantages. The Fisher's LSD, it's filled with, with different studies. It's filled with different things. Power is always the correct decision, yes. But, you know, if he gives you a question, I'll, I'll show you the question in the next slide the next uh, lecture, but yeah. A minimum power of 80 is used for most studies, but you know, if you get 79, no one's gonna say anything. <laughs> so the idea is to calculate the uh, sample size, yada, yada, yada. Like it, this is just whatever, I'm, I'm not really gonna go over that. Can you repeat point three? Yeah, by decreasing variability. Okay, I will let you, Huda, you know this, you know this. When you decrease variability, you make the distribution narrower. So it's the same exact idea as increasing N. Right? When you make something narrower, there's less of an intersection. Like, look, imagine here, instead of increasing n, you just, you, you decrease the variability by some, by some way. Uh, basically, this means that there will be less of an intersection, as you see here, less of an intersection between the two distributions. Thus, the beta will decrease and the power will increase, right? It's the same point as point two. It's just that he mentions it just for the sake of being complete, right? So this is, uh, you all understand this? Huda specifically, do you mention, um, yeah. But he, even he mentions it here, like, like the only thing that you can really have power, um, power, the only thing you really have control over are the type of test you do. That's really what, by the, if you do a master's in biostats, that's what you mainly learn and know how, like how to pick a good test, how to pick a test. Um, there is a very simple uh, diagram that people use it for step two, but that's just for step two. I mean, that's not, even for step one. So any, that diagram is so, um, it's just so basic. It's like something a medical student would need to know. When you do a master's, you learn so many points, you learn so many different tests and the advantages and disadvantages of every single one, the power of every single one, you learn which one uh, you can have the most freedom with, the most flexibility with, which one is hard to use, which one's easy to use, yada, yada, yada. Uh, can you repeat the mean points again? Yeah, so the mean points basically means is that as the means are far away from each other, power increases. So. Uh, as the effect size gets higher, you see, 
he might not tell you the mean. He might not tell you that all oh, this mean is further away. He might tell you that the effect size is larger. So what happens to the power? You should know that if the effect size is higher, that means he's just saying that the mean is higher. So the power is higher. So I don't need to tell you this. This is something that you need to think during the exam, right? Again, what if he told you the effect size is lower? What happens to power? What happens to power if the effect size is lower? Decrease, exactly, decrease. Okay, so you all understand this. So, you know, this, uh, this, lecture, is, this, this lecture is done. This last slide, it's just, you know, it's like about calculate. It's, it's about practical use, and uh, they're not gonna ask you about practical use. At least, uh, at least I hope they don't. Well, did they tell you if they're gonna ask you like about how to calculate power and all this stuff? Because for us, we had, a, we had a whole slide about how to calculate power and it's, and how we can calculate beta and the idea of using alpha and beta as the same point and all this theory about how to calculate them. And it's difficult, Bastiani, basically, you don't need to know. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say too, because, okay. So right now we have 30 minutes left. I think we have enough time for both lectures if you're all willing to stay till 9.30. Possibly even ten, and uh, yeah, I think I think this is a, I, I think we can do it. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do it. Yeah, just to make sure when the curve is narrower, the power gets higher. You are spot on, Huda. Okay, now let's go to uh, comparison of means. This is actually not that difficult. It's a lot easier than hypothesis testing. 